Uh, what? Well, okay, hi. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, introduce you to Piyush, who is the CEO and founder of Lenskart, uh, the largest eyewear brand uh, across the Southeast Asia and, and India. Um, at SoftBank, super privileged uh, to be we part of the Lenskart cap table. We invested in uh, 2019. I've been on the board since then. Uh, been uh, you know, a unique position to see it grow from uh, $100 million of uh, revenue close to a billion. Uh, so, Piyush, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, before Thanks I get so into, uh, you know, the Q&A, uh, I'm not sure everyone knows the, uh, the depth of Lenskart and what they've achieved. So, a little bit of introduction and then we'll get into the Q&A. Thanks, Omer, and uh, happy to be here at Slush. Um, so, Lenskart is a platform for you to buy uh, loads of eyewear for fashion, for utility, whatever you want it to be. Um, at a surprisingly great experience every time. Uh, we are a full stack company, so we design, manufacture, and ship glasses directly to you. So we also end up saving you a lot of money and give you a lot of choice uh, almost every week now. And yeah, so we've been, we've been around for about 12 years, we operate in India, Southeast Asia, Japan, and Middle East. Uh, we're about 15,000 people now uh, across these markets. We ship close to 25 million pairs a year and um, touching about a billion dollars in revenue. Profitable and still a long way to go. Yeah, that's the key word, profitable tech startup, which is, which is amazing. Uh, I think the first question for me, Piyush, is you came back from the States uh, to India, which had a big opportunity. You had a white sheet of paper. Uh, I would have thought you would have gone for horizontal e-commerce, a bigger opportunity. Uh, why vertical, why not horizontal, and why eyewear? Uh, so, you know, we, Lenskart didn't start with a business plan, right? It was, we are missionaries in a lot of ways, because it, for me, I used to work in Seattle at Microsoft, and uh, Bill Gates invited some of us to his house, and he was talking about how he's going to change the world with the foundation after having already changed once already with Microsoft. And I was building new features in Microsoft Office, and I was young enough to think that, you know, why am I not changing the world? So, and that's when we came across the whole problem of, uh, I, I, it, it was just accidental that I came across that about 50% of the world today needs glasses. Uh, which is about four, and, and only 50% of them have it. So about two and a half billion people globally don't have glasses. Uh, and uh, according to WHO and World Economic Forum, they say that this is the biggest health ailment in the world. And on the other hand, I was constantly seeing that the evolution that has happened in apparel, shoes, everywhere, where the quality of life has improved. Uh, you know, I used to run, and there's running shoe and walking shoe and fast, but in eyewear, we've kind of stayed pretty boring and non-evolutionary. So I think it was like, let's go change the world, let's uh, transform the way people see. So it wasn't literally a decision between horizontal and vertical. It was like, let's do something that would be worthwhile doing. No, fair, fair. But you know, early in your journey, and I remember asking this question also when we invested, is big opportunity, very focused, but I know you flirted with other verticals. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a question I asked when we were investing, like, oh man, are you going to be focused on lenses or are we going to do other stuff? Uh, why, why was that? Why the temptation? Well, that was, that was the side effect of raising money, I think. <laughs> um, you know, we raised money and uh, suddenly, I think in the middle, we got distracted and we were chasing GMV. We were working not for the purpose, but for the next fundraise. And we never realized when, did that, ha when that happened because... Uh, there was a point in time we were reflecting back in a conversation and it just occurred that about 80% of our revenue was coming from non-eyewear. And that wasn't the reason we started the company. We started the company to transform the way people see. Um, and it was a tough decision because if we wanted to go back to our purpose, we had to shave off 80% of our revenue, which means no fundraise. Uh, and from growing company to a degrowing company, uh, but I'm glad we took that call. It was a tough one. We shaved off 80% of our revenue, went back to our purpose, and we had all this team which is working on all different accessories. We put them back into eyewear and there's no looking back ever. Okay, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive that you, that you managed to course correct and accept that, that there's a change of strategy. I think it's important to write. I think 
I've realized when we write these things and we can go back to the manual, it helps. Because right. we often get distracted. That's true, that's true. And so the next question I had for you is, and I think there are a lot of investors <laughs> uh, and, and founders here. Your cap table is A+, uh, SoftBank, if I can call it A+. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you have TPG, uh, TPG Growth, uh, Adia, Tamase, KKR, you know, the who's who. Um, and one of the few companies in India which has actually given large secondaries to a lot of their investors. Um, I think from your perspective, why, when, which investor, uh, you know, who adds, what do you look for? Um, and I'm sure it's not been a super easy ride. You don't need to tell me here who you want off your board. I'm sure you <laughs> want some people off your board. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think from a founder, love to get your perspective on, because you selected them very carefully. Uh, so what was the thought process? So first rule, I think, of the game in my view is that beyond money, you have to have a good chemistry with the person who's going to invest money. And there have been times where you walk out of the meeting thinking everything is good, valuation is good, check is good, uh, money is good, but, and I, and, and I understand that sometimes you don't have that privilege, uh, but am I going to feel good about working with this person? So that was obviously the, uh, the benchmark initially. But over the years, I think it was very clear to me that this is not a short-term journey. It's going to take maybe 10, 20 years. And at each stage, it's important to get the investor, at least in my view, who's aligned to that stage. And also, before signing the final documents, I always used to ask uh, the investors, like, wh why are you investing? What is in it for you? And what is your expectation? Um, I remember once you were about to sign the deal just before SoftBank with someone, and I asked him the car, we are so expensive. Where do you see? And every time I felt that that is misaligned, I won't take the money. I remember in SoftBank case, we took, what, six months yeah. to align <laughs> on what we want to do with LensCard and what SoftBank wants to do in LensCard until that alignment happened. And then, so SoftBank, we took money literally when about after five, six years, we felt that we have a product market fit. Um, and there was a big debate between the co-founders saying, if we take this much capital in the company, because it was pretty much more capital than we had raised over the last six years collectively, would we be able to justify? And so the idea was, okay, if we have this capital, let's invest behind talent and technology and see if we can make it big. So that was the purpose of the SoftBank round. And I think, uh, in hindsight, that was a very good decision uh, and allowed us to take some of the big bets. We never ended up consuming that capital till we did this acquisition recently, and so it was helpful with that. And then once we started sort of seeing profitability, we wanted to get investors who don't have a short time horizon. So we went with the sovereign funds like Adia and Temasek, who can stay invested pretty much lifetime in a company, or at least 10, 12 years, uh, as long as you're going and delivering what you want to deliver. So, yeah, I think we have been fortunate to have that, uh, but if there's an expectation mismatch, I think things go wrong. So you have to be very careful about the partners. I have often uh, gone with a lower valuation with the right partner versus a higher valuation, uh, but maybe not the best fit partner. Yeah. Um, and I've al also seen that if the value system between the partner and you are not aligning, there'll always be a problem. That's perfect. I'm but gonna... I, I want to ask you, why did you, I mean, why did you guys invest in LensCard? Because in those days, we were not so big. We were not so, maybe not so tech first, as SoftBank would call it in terms of your equation. We were not the platform business. So what was in it for? No, so I, I think two things. So I think one is, you know, you do the model, you do the mathematical. It's a very high margin business. Uh, it's, uh, you, were, you were definitely the leader there. But I think more for us was the way you and the team approached the business. Uh, they were truly focused on this single mission. The TAM for us was big enough, and I think the fact that we got a good feeling that you're not gonna get distracted really excited us. Uh, you can build a retail business, a lot of people can build it, but I'm not sure how many people can build it by being tech first <laughs> and that paranoia about consumer excellence. Everyone kind of, until you, until you don't have that, I don't think you're going to build a, a, a really kick-ass brand. And with Piyush and team, we said, every time we spoke to him, he didn't talk about valuation, he didn't talk about 
uh, you know, kind of how big this company could become and you know, that's our job. But he spoke about customer obsession and I need a really good team around me. And I think that really excited us to say, uh, okay, this is someone and the team who we would, we would love to back. Uh, two questions I had while you build Lenskart to this scale. Um, and I think the two questions which worried us uh, a lot. One is I know you used to get a little bit annoyed every time you said, oh, you like the Warby Parker of India. Trust me, <laughs> I've been at Slush and everybody asks me what do you do and I say we run eyewear companies. Like, oh, like Warby Parker. I think they've definitely done. It's a yeah. good thing, I think, because it allows... Uh, it's a good starting point. It's not the best starting point. Yeah, but it's a, it's a Warby Parker with, uh, I think, 5x the revenue and 5x the value. But... Um, so I, I know you get, uh, you're like, don't compare me to Warby Parker. But I think the most important point for investors and coming into, I guess, until uh, maybe two or three years ago is, how would you compete with Amazon and Flipkart? The question was, Amazon is in India, is doing extremely well. They can enter this segment anytime and with the might of technology, capital, etc. So how did you keep, Am Amazon never even tried uh, uh, messing with lens card, if I can say that. How did you manage that? Well, I never say never. I think, though, I think by staying grounded and staying core to our proposition, not getting distracted, learning from our mistakes, uh, solving the tough problems, uh, knowing that if someone came with all the money and all the might, you would still be able to deliver a great surprising experience all the time to customers. I think it's all about staying super focused. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I mean, we have to be prepared. Yep. I won't say you, you can just assume that they would not do it. Um, we have to be prepared. We have to know our customers better than they would know, our, know this category. We have spent 12 years in it. And if, if we don't do that well, um, like one of the things I would say is as the company grows, the amount of, I, I used to spend like 200 days with customers earlier. And as the company grows, that time reduces. And I, I think what we need to do is go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. Spend time with customers. Know, if we know our customers better, then we can... Got it. Now, I, I guess, you know, with, with the amount of founders, et cetera, in the room, uh, 25 million uh, prescription glasses a year, uh, 25 million customers, I think you're going to get close to a billion dollars of revenue. What were the biggest challenges scaling uh, normally, companies get stuck at the 200 odd million. Uh, you're going to be 5x of that and profitable. Uh, top three learnings or top three issues founders should keep top of mind? Yeah, I, I, to be honest, when we were at about that 200 million dollar number, we were worried. And those were the time we were growing at maybe 25, 30% a year. And people used to come and tell us, why didn't you not grow faster? This is not the fastest growing startup. And what I realized was that, you know, while the initial years of the company was about customer obsession, to go beyond this $200 million, we had to do something different. So we had to, and that was, we had to now create a team and a culture which can deliver that customer obsession versus doing it ourselves. I think this doing versus creating a system which can deliver, which can take decisions, was a big shift. I would, I would say that we were only customer obsessed. We were not talent obsessed. And so I, as you know, I took the role of chief people officer for two years because I wanted to get deep and we just kept raising the bar. We knew one thing very clear that if we don't cross this, it, it is something internal. It, because the market is there, the problem is there. I mean, in India alone, there are by about 700 million people who are without glasses right now. So it has to be execution. And so we stayed persistent. It wasn't easy. We failed many times. Uh, but I think we kept at it. And, if, and we were very clear if we are failing, it is internal. And we kept raising the bar of talent and kept learning from uh, the Googles and the Amazon on how they are, even from deciding how to attend a meeting, how to write a meeting note, how to document it, what kind of talent needs to bring in, how do we need to, how deep we want to go into the problem. Uh, and I think that's probably paid off. And then a lot of people say that the first eight years of Lenskart, we grew at 30% and last three years we grew at 60%. I think it's to do with people and culture. Got it. And I think when, when India was, was humming and you know, uh, by far the leader in the country, you said, okay, this is not enough. Uh, let me go and expand to Japan and Southeast Asia. And uh, 
Lenskart bought a company in own days, uh, which is a Japanese-based company, but operations all over Southeast Asia, uh, a large Czech uh, acquisition. I mean, what gave you the confidence that you could, you know, I mean, I don't know if you speak Japanese, but uh, what gave you the I confidence? Understand, <laughs> I understand when a Japanese says something in Japanese, what they really mean. Oh, okay, fine, all right, fine. <laughs> so if, it, if they don't give you a meeting, means they don't like you, baby. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, why do you think the company was ready? Uh, you could have, I think, even without own days, Lens card would be a eight, ten billion dollar outcome. Where did that confidence come from? I know you chased the founders. They said no to you, I think, five to six times. Uh, why that perseverance? Uh, and what was the learning there? Yeah, I think this was about the time that I think we had pretty much become very obsessed about our mission. More obsessed than we were in the first eight, ten years, where we had clearly said that. Uh, we are not in for the IPO, we are not in for the outcome, we are here for the impact. We're going to impact X number of lives. And Southeast Asia has about 80% myopia today. Uh, when you go to Korea and Hong Kong, it's 90%. Singapore is 80%. And uh, by the age of kids gets to 18, 80% kids are myopic in India, uh, teenagers. And so for us, we were doing a lot of tech in India now and at a scale. And we wanted, we knew that we could extend this. And we, could, we were looking at markets, but this seemed like a market which needed it the most. So I think we went back to our purpose. So that's why Southeast Asia, largely, and it was again, you know, we just turned profitable. It was a big bet. And I, you know, the conversation at the board was like, if you want to do it, we'll support it. But if you don't want to do it, there's no pressure. Uh, so it was a big bet. I think my neck was on the line more than anything else. Uh, but what gave me the confidence was again the mission. Um, and uh, the second part about why Japan and why, you know, again, there's a risk there and why, you know, we, we made by about five offers yep. uh, and then we made the sixth offer, so we were very persistent. I think this was the time when I had taken the HR role, right? And I kind of started figuring out that what works at Lenskart, right? What, what, what kind of things work? So what I realized is that the relationships that work at Lenskart are the one where there's a, whether it's investor, whether it's employees, whether it's vendors, uh, where there's a commonality of cultural values, right? We, we've often seen that we, may, we, we can hire people who may not have done that before, but if we hire people who sort of align with us the way we think in terms of obsession, 10x thinking, agility, discontentment, that, then that relationship lasts long. And m and is always like, the success rate is what, 1%, yep. maybe 2%. So the, the chances of failure was higher than success. And uh, so to me, you know, I'd known these founders and every time I go back and I used to visit, we had the same values customer obsession, frugality, agility, um, you know, collaboration, the, the thought process on how you are taking decisions. And I kind of felt that while we may get other opportunities, we may not get this alignment. And then the risk is higher, so it's okay to pay that premium. And I think we stayed persistent. It took a lot of convincing. I had to literally live in Japan for a long time. Uh, and I'm glad we got it done. It's yep. been one and a half years, phenomenal journey, I think. We have now 13 cultures at Lenskart from one Indian company, and we have 13 cultures. So it's been an amazing learning about diversity, inclusion, and how to... And, and what have you learned from own days? Obviously, the Lenskart culture is good. What have you benefited from their culture? Um, you know, the Japanese planning and excellence in customer experience. I think we do a lot of things with technology. They do just a lot of things with culture. Right. right? And the training and the, just the planning. I mean, we... We, I, I think we think we plan, but I think where our planning stops, it starts. Right? I've been to events, I know the meticulousness with which, and, and, uh, we, and we are bringing a lot of that uh, now into Lenskart in India and Southeast right. Asia. Got it. And uh, I think a little bit, I do want to focus on, uh, I don't think people maybe here don't appreciate the volume of eyewear that you ship and the remote parts of India where you've promised next day delivery. Uh, I want to talk, I just want them to appreciate and just talk a little bit about the new manufacturing plant you've built and how you manage to ship 25 million glasses a year and next day delivery 
in India where the infrastructure is not the best? I think you asked this question about that tomorrow if Amazon comes into this business, what would you do? I think the answer lies there. We have to solve the tough problems. You know, the easier problems everybody can solve. Eventually, I do feel that as consumers, we are used to these great experiences in all other categories. We are getting spoiled every day with selection, with choice, 10 minute delivery. But in Iway, we kind of don't expect it. So somebody's going to do it. And so, about when, when the whole COVID period started, uh, we did a vote in the company and we asked if we could deliver glasses next day, which nobody has really done from a centralized ecosystem, what do we think our business would grow by? And the minimum answer I get was 50%, and the highest was like 10, 100%. And so we had all the money that SoftBank had given us, which we did not consume. So we said, let's build the largest factory in the world. Let's put all the automation and work backward to say that if a pair of order comes at 9 p.m. in the night, can I sh get it delivered next day? And on the paper, it looked impossible. So I think uh, we put in $100 million of cash in building a factory and uh, uh, with a clear purpose. Uh, and now we are delivering, right? We are delivering glasses next day. Uh, we recently did a survey. There's nobody else in the world who's able to do this. Uh, but eventually what I've seen is that the, the tough problems are difficult to solve. And it's the basics that you need to get to. Uh, and I remember the journey we were about 40 net promoter score. We went to 50, we went to 60, we went to 70. All happen every year. But then we were stuck at about 71, 72 for four years. Right. And it won't move because it was good enough. I mean, we had 60, per, you know, 80% promoters, 10% detractors, 10% passive. What's, that? What's wrong? And then when we built this factory, we started delivering next day. Now we just recently crossed 80. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? I think the, I mean, we don't have time today, but I think the other story, if you ever meet Piyush, is how the company, uh, India went through a very strict lockdown overnight. Um, and we have 2,000 plus retail stores. And, and how Lenskart cope with that, uh, both morale for the, for the organization as well as keeping costs under control was just remarkable. Uh, I, don't have, I don't think you have time to go through that, but, but that was exceptional. Uh, we're sitting in Europe. Uh, own days is going according to plan. You have, I know your balance sheet is extremely strong. You have lots of investors knocking on your door. When is the M&A in Europe? Uh, you've done a small one in, in France, I know. Uh, but is Lenskart going to be seen on the streets of Helsinki and London? And well, we've made a little bit of start with <laughs> Paris. We just invested in a brand called La Patide Lunitaire in Paris. Um, we have a lot on our plate, to be honest. And I, I want to make sure that we are able to, you know, we only bite as much as we can chew. But, you know, with the vision that we have to serve a billion people, we'll eventually get it. What do you think? Should we? I mean, you, you manage both India and Europe. What no, do you no, think? I, I think the... Uh, the quality of your glasses, uh, the design, uh, the price at which you offer them, uh, I think the market is wide open. Uh, and I think just like uh, any other country, I think the retailers here are still more offline than online. Uh, and I think we, you can really shake that up by being uh, you know, online first mentality. And if you offer next day delivery of uh, prescription glasses, uh, that's going to be phenomenal. See, I think as this culture of multiplies of being able to take decisions, uh, you know, in multiple geographies with the same mindset, it becomes much easier to scale. Correct. Uh, I'm going to ask you, I guess, two questions. One, I do have to ask you about AI. I know you're <laughs> a very tech-first brand, but where do you see, or what is your vision for AI for Lenskart, right? Uh, let me spend 30 seconds on that. But more importantly, what's the next five years for Lenskart? Um, you know, and where do you see it uh, in scale, in geography? Uh, and, and do you have the, I know you have the capital, but what will be the biggest constraint to get there? So look, I, when I was at Microsoft, Bill Gates used to speak about AI, right? And uh, I always believe that technology and AI is not, it's, it's a means to an end, right? You have to have, the, you can't start with saying, okay, let's do AI. You have to say, okay, this is the problem. And what can technology do and what can AI do? I'll tell you, uh, exam I mean, we do facial recommendation. 
now we've been doing it for 10 years and it got better and better with AI. But I'll give you a use case which probably is not as common. We open now 50 stores a month. And I used to sit in those meetings where, you know, everybody would present a property and people would say, okay, this location will do this much revenue, this location would do this much. And we used to get it wrong 50% of the time. And then we started building a machine learning model based on our existing locations. And today, nobody makes a decision. We have been opening, we opened 400 stores last year. We opened 400 stores the year before. We can today, with 95% plus accuracy, predict the revenue of a store before we open it. Yeah. And we can deliver payback in eight months. So this is good use of AI. And what, is, what generative AI is doing is it's opened doors now for vision correction on the phone. So that's what I'm excited about most. And I think, uh, so doors are opening, but I think you have to start with the problem. And the problem has to be big. Where I see Lenskart, firstly, I don't think five years. I think I'm Sorry, a I'm little an investor. Bit, I look at five years exit. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, and which is why we now have Adia <laughs> after you come in, because they think 20, 30 years in Temasek. Um, uh, two things, right? We want to serve a billion people. There are two and a half billion people without glasses. If we can serve a billion people, I think that would be, uh, we, we internally call it vision for billion. And the second thing I think is, it has to become self-propelling. Like, I'm a big fan of what Amazon has built in terms of an ecosystem, <clears throat> a culture which can <clears throat> replicate and, you know, you can continue to grow consistently and make the impact. So I think it has to become an ecosystem, an organization, which can keep solving the problems and transform the way people see and experience the world. Fantastic. I think the, my uh, timer is blinking. I hope you guys enjoy, enjoy the session. For me, we've been associated for five years, known each other for six to seven years. As exciting <coughs> and thrilled to always hear Piyush, uh, what he's built and what he's go continued going to build. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>